all so much. We're going to get started and we may have some attendees come and go um, and that's fine. Please do what you need to for today. So thank you and welcome to our Crawford School Masterclass. Um, we'd like to acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands and airways we now meet and work and whose cultures are among the oldest continuing cultures in human history. Uh, welcome to everyone from Australia and indeed around the world here today. Uh, really excited to be bringing you Crawford School, a masterclass. We have three top academics who are actually going to give you sort of a 15 minute taster um, of their research and also the way that they teach. So fantastic that you can be joining us. Just a reminder that the session is fully recorded uh, until we cease. Um, so just so you're informed of that. We're also going to ask too that you use the Q&A button down the bottom of your bar um, for any questions and answers as we move into the session. If you have questions as they come up, please type them in and um, the academics will pick those up and we'll deal with those as we go um, or more likely towards the end of the session. I'm Cecily Stewart. I'm the Manager of National Recruitment here at Crawford School. And I'm also joined here today by my colleague, Liz Ingram, who's the Manager of International Recruitment at Crawford School, and we're both available to help out with any questions. Uh, we have representatives from Crawford School's academic programs um, here to join you today. As you're probably aware, Crawford School is really committed to the highest quality teaching and learning experience. And at Crawford School, we are very proud because our world leading academics, three of whom are here with you today, teach in our lecture theatres across our degree programs. So when you come and, and join with us as a student, you actually have access to engage with the best and brightest in your study areas. We're gonna hear from each presenter for around 15 minutes, uh, and then we'll move to the Q&A session at about quarter to two today. As I said, please use the Q&A button. Uh, we won't be looking for questions in the chat. We will only be using the Q&A for, for the questions. Uh, I'd like now to introduce um, and welcome our speakers for today. So I'll introduce all three of them and then we'll, we'll get started. So Associate Professor Sango Mahanti is our first speaker. Sango is the Program Director for the Resources, Environment and Development Group and the Academic Convener for two of our degrees, the Graduate Certific Certificate in Environmental Management Online and the Master of Environmental Management and Development. We also have Professor Peter Whitefoot. Peter is the Director of the Social Policy Institute at Crawford School and also contributes in teaching in the school's policy and governance program. And that program delivers the Graduate Certificate of Public Policy, the Masters of Public Policy and the Masters of Public Administration. And we have Kristen Sobeck, who is a Senior Research Officer at the Tax and Transfer Policy Institute. And she contributes in the education program at the School for the Economics for Policy. And that team delivers the Masters of International and Development Economics and the Masters of Environment and Resource Economics. So we have a full, a full fleet um, representing all of the degree programs that we teach across Crawford School. And I'd really like to welcome and thank them all so much for their time today. Um, I'm going to now hand over to Sango, who's going to kick off um, our Crawford School Masterclass session. Thank you, Sango. Thank you, Cecily. Let me just share my PowerPoint slides with you. Can everyone see that okay? Are we good? All right. Um, so um, today I would like to share a few insights from some research that I'm currently re leading in the Mekong region. Um, and this is a region that's facing really major social and environmental transformations, um, especially due to large scale infrastructure projects like the hydropower dam that's pictured in this opening slide. And um, this project that I'm currently working on is funded by the Australian Research Council and it's studying processes of nature society rupture, that's the term that we're using, to describe sort of major and dramatic processes of environmental and social change. And this project um, is, um, it's not just me doing this, I'm working with a team from ANU, in fact, colleagues from within the Crawford School and within my group, as well as um, a collaborator at the University of Sydney and in Cambodia and Vietnam as well. And our focus is particularly on mainland Southeast Asia and um, we're doing case research in Cambodia, Vietnam, Laos, and also to some extent in Thailand. 
um, because when you're looking at some of these infrastructure projects, it's quite important to go beyond a national level to think what's happening regionally as well. And we're particularly interested in the interactive nature of these social and environmental change processes. For example, how do dams, hydropower dams, interact with other forms of land use change that might be going on around them? Um, and how, how do they interact with even larger scale processes of change, such as climate change? And we're also trying to um, understand how communities who are impacted by some of these developments, how do they make sense of these change processes? And how do they respond to the transformations that are going on in their lives and in their environments. So um, this project that I described on rupture is just one example of the very diverse array of research that's going on in our resources, environment and development group. And some really compelling themes that my colleagues are working on. And you can check out more on this on our program website. Um, just to give you a couple of examples. So the particular project that I was just talking about sits within the theme of political ecology, um, dealing with nature, power and state society relationships. But I have colleagues working on climate change, environmental governance, um, food security, um, value chains for resources like timber and a whole lot more than that. Um, and our research very closely informs the courses that we teach um, and research projects, student research projects that we supervise. And so it's really integral to kind of our teaching approach and the student experience in our master's and graduate certificate programs. So I'm going to go back to um, the story from our rupture project now. So the lower Sesan 2 dam in Cambodia is just one of many hydropower dams that are being built in mainland Southeast Asia currently. Um, and you might wonder about whether hydropower is a positive energy option in this region, because we often talk about hydropower in this light in Australia with, for example, recent discussions about pump hydropower as a clean energy source, um, after all, hydropower doesn't involve using fossil fuels and it's quite a large generation capacity which um, can meet the needs of this very fast growing region and quickly developing region. And according to sustainable development goal number nine, which I've pictured here, in theory, it is possible to have sustainable infrastructure if we build it in ways that are more inclusive and perhaps innovative but once you start to look on the ground at some of the transformations that are going on around these hydropower schemes, it quickly becomes much more complicated than this um, because of the, the disruptions that we're seeing to social and environmental systems. Um, now, this is a map um, that gives you a sense of hydropower development in the region. Um, so research by our group and others like um, the Stimson Centre here shows that it's really important to keep the bigger picture in our sites when we're thinking about the impacts of these kinds of development schemes. Um, so the map shows you dams that are currently in construction and operational and you can really get a sense here of the scale of construction activity that's underway and also the potential for disruption to the really significant river systems um, that they're built on um, and within the catchments of in this region. And of course, for the people whose lives depend on these river systems. And it's not only about dams either. So in Cambodia, for instance, Dam construction can provide an opportunity for other forms of resource extraction to creep in. Um, and what I've got in this image here is a picture of a couple of chainsaws. Um, so timber extraction is very common around um, dam sites, usually before the reservoir is flooded. Um, and this is usually engineered and controlled in the Cambodian context by elite interests but will typically be implemented by local people who perhaps are desperate 
for livelihood options and so will participate um, in these extractive processes. Sorry, I'll just go back. Um, the other thing is um, the areas around these dam sites are often already committed to various forms of land use. Um, and so here we can see um, a map around the, the Cezanne Reservoir. So I'm, a lot of my case material is coming from the Lower Cezanne 2 Dam, which is where I was actually working back in January this year, pre-COVID times. <laughs> um, so the areas around this, the, this particular dam, um, for example, has um, large plantation um, developments which are called in the Cambodian context economic land concessions shown in red. So people who are displaced by the dam may have quite limited options um, in terms of places where they can go, other agricultural lands that they might be able to develop because it's already being, the land, available land is already being squeezed by some of these other um, allocations. And so those also tend to um, limit the, the other kinds of natural resources, forest resources or riverine resources that people might have customarily used before. Projects like Lower Cezanne 2 usually involve um, involuntary resettlement. Um, and so here in this image, you can see a picture of a new village that was built for people who were displaced by the Lower Cezanne 2 Dam. And resettlement brings many livelihood and cultural adjustments um, for the communities that are affected. Dams in remote areas like this, and in fact, in the case of Lower Cezanne 2, did displace indigenous minority communities. And usually we're dealing with really significant changes to their ways of life. Um, for example, often there's a much heavier reliance on the cash economy, whereas they might have had more subsistence or mixed um, livelihoods before having to resettle. And at the same time, um, affected peoples like the ones who are living in this resettlement village often have very little bargaining power relative to companies that might be um, building the resettlement facilities and um, government agencies. So basically, um, you know, there's, there's not a great deal of negotiation possible around the specific conditions um, of, of the resettlement packages often. One example here is the issue of water supply. Um, so this is drilling down into the um, resettlement village that I showed you a picture of just before. And in this village, the company had built several wells um, for villagers to use in their new environment. But unfortunately, the well water had really high bacterial counts, which the villagers didn't kind of have the water tested, but they could tell from the smell. And then later, I was able to take a sample for testing, and it had very high coliform levels in the water, which is not safe for them to use for drinking and washing. And unfortunately, the villagers had not been able to get any action to fix this issue. Um, so what they had to do was to pay for the water instead to be trucked in um, by a private contractor. And then they would fill their little local tanks next to their house and had to use that for co cooking and washing. And a, a little drop like this would cost maybe around US $6 per delivery, and that might last them a couple of weeks. So, you know, for, for one month, it might be 12 or even $18 US, which is actually a higher um, fee than, say, a person living in Phnom Penh might pay for their monthly water supply. The other thing that we're finding is that the construction of roads and the opening up of land in the process of dam construction um, has really brought a lot of new migrants to the area. And in this um, location, we found that tensions were mounting between these informal migrants who had kind of come in, in this case, with their boats to do commercial fishing in the reservoir that was formed by the dam and the resettlement village that was nearby, whose picture I showed you before. And so you have kind of competition for resources. And really what we found was that there was a resource conflict brewing between these two communities. 
Um, and there are many other spillover effects that are playing out across the river system as it interacts with other forms of environmental change. Um, so of course, fish is a really key resource in the Mekong catchment. Um, and in the Cambodian context, um, the hydropower dams, not just Lower Saison too, but there's various other dams going on in the, in the Mekong catchment and even directly on the Mekong River um, that are associated with diminishing fish catch and threats to important fish breeding areas like the Ton Sap Lake. Um, importantly, the people affected by Lower Cezanne too have not been completely passive um, in the whole dam construction and resettlement process. It's a really interesting case actually because some of the villages um, that were impacted by the dam refused to resettle to these newly established resettlement villages. Why and how were they able to do this? So this is something that we were really fascinated to explore. Um, with the villagers. Um, so what we found was they had support from some civil society groups within their province and were also networked with regional and I mean kind of transboundary um, networks in mainland Southeast Asia and beyond. Interestingly, um, on a visit by the Prime Minister to the Lower Sesan II project during the construction phase, um, this elderly villager also got in the ear of the Prime Minister um, and kind of approached him directly to appeal for, for their cause. Um, and eventually the Prime Minister told the province that some of these people who were resisting the move to the resettlement village should be permitted to stay on their ancestral lands. They did have to, of course, move from their original village because it was flooded by the dam reservoir. But instead of moving to the resettlement village that I showed you earlier, um, they were able to build a new settlement that was still on their customary lands and sort of close to their flooded village. And so we've been studying what sorts of conditions help people to be proactive and gain some agency in shaping their lives during these kinds of processes of dramatic nature society change, because we feel it's a really important case to learn from, um, even in terms of how people find agency in the face of kind of processes like climate change and adaptation to some of these large scale change processes. So what does all of this mean for policy? It's a really complex setting and like most environmental challenges that we're dealing with today, the policy solutions are unfortunately not simple. In our research and in our teaching, we're really trying to grasp the politics and the very nuanced social and environmental dimensions of these projects. And I guess what we're trying to do is to highlight the social and environmental risks in this case around particular kinds of development pathways. And we engage directly with um, policy makers, with civil society in the countries where we work to share information about some of these issues and I guess to facilitate dialogue around these. Um, by making trade-offs visible and by sharing knowledge about some of these social impacts and risks, we're trying to get more open debate around some of these issues and we're interested in how local actors um, can network with civil society to amplify their concerns and improve their outcomes on the ground. And really, this is no easy feat when we're dealing with sometimes illiberal governance settings where people may not have, um, you know, an, an easy way to um, voice their views to government. Um, now, I'd just like to finish by showing you how some of this research feeds into teaching. And this is just an example from a course that I teach, but actually I think any one of my colleagues um, in our group within the Crawford School and possibly even at ANU more broadly um, could tell similar stories about how our research kind of infuses our, our teaching. So apart from doing research at Lower Saison too, I incorporate this case study in the course that I run on social impact assessment. So with students, I critically review the environmental and social impact assessment that was conducted on this particular project. And the course is really aiming to teach students how to 
do or contribute to social impact assessment studies. Um, but we do this with, with a lot of critical reflection on the sorts of limitations that we face in doing this kind of work within different regulatory contexts. Um, so, for example, um, you know, we basically go quite deeply into how, how the social research was conducted, what sorts of limitations they faced, um, and what sorts of mitigation measures. So you can just get a sense of the sorts of issues that, that we're covering here, the politics of resettlement projects and how difficult it can be to actually get fair processes of um, resettlement happening around these kinds of infrastructure schemes. And so the students leave with an, with an appreciation, not just of how to do social impact assessment, but also the limitations of our systems for assessing and planning for these kinds of projects. Um, and that's what we mean by research led teaching, which is something that um, we do very strongly in, I think all of our masters programs within the Crawford School and certainly within our Master of Environmental Development, uh, Environmental Management and Development and our um, grad cert um, that's connected to that as well. So I might leave it there. Thanks very much, um, Cecily, and I'll stop my screen share now. Great. Thank Thanks. you so much, Sango, um, for just an extraordinary 15 minute uh, of yeah, really complex policy issues that are going on. And I think Sango's work reminds us too that Crawford School is located within the College of Asia and the Pacific in ANU, one of the flagship colleges, and we have real depth of expertise across Asia Pacific as well as national policy. And um, on that, I will throw to Peter Whiteford. Hello all. Um, I'm going to talk about, um, um, as, as, as Cecily mentioned earlier, um, I'm part of the uh, what's called the policy and governance um, scheme, um, the course, courses, the Master of Public Policy and the Master of Public Administration. My own specialisation is in social policy, um, which overlaps quite a lot with what Kristen is going to talk about next in terms of tax and transfer policy, and in particular in relation to social security policy. So I was just going to talk today about um, some new research um, that I've recently finished um, relation, relating to a um, what's really a social security policy fiasco in Australia. Uh, and I'll, um, but hopefully it has uh, broader lessons of things not to do. I'll just start sharing my screen. Right, so um, that's, uh, it, the, it's called Debt by Design and it's about a, um, a social policy fiasco, as I said, that has recently, um, it's still not complete, it's ongoing in many respects. Uh, uh, the name of this um, fiasco is uh, in, in common parlance, it's called Robo Debt. Um, uh, and I want to describe how this particular problem occurred. Um, there's an extensive literature in the public administration and to some extent in public policy as well about what are called policy failures. Um, there are many people who sometimes call them blunders fiascos, disasters, and catastrophes. So they're, they're terms used to uh, look at what happens when something goes wrong. There's a sort of a hierarchy there. Policy failures are often, you can refer to them when uh, somebody implements a policy that just overruns its cost. Um, so there's a historic literature that goes back to um, the, um, building of the under, underground uh, rail system in, in San Francisco, um, even the building of the Sydney Opera House, uh, which went a long way over budget. Um, but as I said, uh, a blunder sort of implies that um, you meant well, but something went wrong. Uh, when people talk about catastrophes, they're talking about things like World War I, so let's try and avoid that. Um, but that was a, a result of a set of policy decisions taken leading up to World War I that, um, almost made it inevitable. But a fiasco, which is what I'm talking about, is something where there's a, a serious policy failure uh, that at, attracts a lot of attention in politically, and it's usually argued that it was foreseeable. Uh, so I'm talking about something that's recently occurred in Australia, which in my view and a lot of other people's views uh, should have been foreseen beforehand. Uh, the beginning was back in um, 2000 and 
uh, the 2015-16 budget. That's uh, in Australia. We have our budgets uh, normally, not this year, in uh, in May. Um, and uh, it was an announcement that the government would save about $1.7 billion Australia over five years by enhancing fraud protection, um, the fraud detection, I sh should say, uh, and getting people to pay back um, over payments. Uh, it was actually implemented uh, in the middle of July 2016, so it was announced one year, implemented the next year, um, in what's called the online compliance intervention. So it's um, people had to go online to access uh, social security, um, uh, access government services, an online service in order to, to engage uh, and report their income. Uh, in addition to this new uh, computer system or, or reporting system uh, that was involved, uh, the government also introduced an interest charge on debts. They removed the limitation, um, which had previously been you couldn't recover a debt that had been um, that was over six years old, and they introduced um, uh, departure prohibition orders. So if you had one of these debts, um, you could be stopped at the airport before you actually left the country. Um, now, the why it's called robo debt is that um, it's based on a computer comparison, a computer based comparison of uh, what people reported to the benefit agency while they were receiving benefits up to six years previously. Uh, and also um, what they had reported in their annual tax returns. So in Australia, um, it's normal for people who are taxpayers to um, uh, do a consolidation once a year, which reports their income for the whole year. Now, this uh, cross-checking of uh, people's tax records and their benefit records had actually been going on since 1991, so for 25 years beforehand. Uh, it was both an integrity measure, i.e. to check that people were uh, giving accurate information to the um, uh, to the benefits agency called Centrelink, and uh, it was also at the time it was actually used to increase take up of payments because um, the government had announced a, um, a program of reducing child poverty, and they actually actively went out and tried to identify people who were not receiving the payments to which they were entitled through this. Now, it's called robo debt. Uh, because it involved a, um, for many people, um, initially an unknown number of people, a default calculation of whether you owed the government money. So there was a comparison of what you reported to the tax office. There was records of what you'd reported to the benefits agency while you were receiving benefits, and the two numbers were compared. Um, but in a number of cases, quite a number of cases, in fact, um, the way they worked out what you should have reported to the benefits agency um, was by dividing your annual income by 26, the number of fortnights in the year. Uh, they also reversed the onus of proof on benefit recipients. So previously, before a debt had been identified, um, a discrepancy was identified between the two sets of records and the, uh, the government agency employed people who went through in detail and um, tried to check whether there was a debt. So they, they looked through the files, they asked people for information, they could go to the previous employer if they were still operating and request payment information. And uh, whereas now what happened was they, they got rid of that human part of the intervention and um, the former claimants, some of whom, many of whom are former, some of whom are current claimants, um, had to provide records of wages or, uh, or bank transactions in order to substantiate what they had reported up to six years ago to the benefits agency. Um, now, the, as I said, it's called RoboDebt because it uh, involved um, not a particularly complicated algorithm, dividing people's annual income by 26 is, um, uh, you could do that on the back of an envelope, but, uh, but they did it in the computer system. Um, but this reverse onus of proof where rather than checking, having uh, officers of Centrelink check whether people you know, go through people's records in detail before they uh, sent out a debt, this new reverse, uh, reverse onus of proof meant that they could um, massively upscale the number of debts they sent out. So previously, when there was manual checking, uh, they, they had identified about 20,000 discrepancies a year, which they thought were worth pursuing. 
Um, under the new system, they started identifying, they generated about 20,000 letters per week, um, rather than 20,000 per year. So there was this massive increase in uh, the amount of activity that was identified. Um, towards the end of the year, when people started getting debts, uh, towards the end of 2016, um, the um, members of the public started complaining um, to the Department of Human Services. The opposition shadow minister requested the Auditor General to investigate. Uh, there was an extensive um, um, sort of both mainstream media and in you know, new media uh, reporting. So there was a Twitter account set up in January 2017, which collates case stories. It's still available. Um, the Ombudsman reported in April 2017, there was the first Senate Community Affairs Committee, um, which reported in June. There were also at that time, um, many um, reported um, judgments in the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. So if the, if the government decides to um, say you've got a debt or a number of other things, or that you're not entitled benefits, uh, what can you, you individuals have the right to appeal to a, a tribunal? Um, now, there were five cases uh, that we know of that were overturned, which the government didn't appeal. Uh, they, so that, so, so the, the government lost the case in the Administrative Appeals Tribunal, but they then didn't appeal it because if they had appealed it at the second level, those judgments are public but the first level judgments are not public. So by not appealing, they kept the negative judgments um, uh, out of the public eye. Uh, and the person who later, uh, um, uh, Terry Carney, who's a emeritus professor of law at Sydney University and for nearly 40 years was a member of the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. Um, uh, a freedom of information request made it, uh, identified um, uh, that he'd made these five adverse judgments. Um, in September of that year, um, he was not reappointed to the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. Um, and he basically argued in 2018 that um, essentially this was wrong because the failure of a person to disprove a debt is not, under social security law, a legal foundation for a debt. Uh, so uh, the, this went on. Um, now, in May 2019, um, the, there's a, um, Australia has um, legal aid agencies which are, um, are able to assist people if they have problems with the law. Um, and they bought a what's called um, the, the Masterton case, which was somebody who was appealing uh, her, her debt. Um, just, just before it came to court in May 2019, uh, the Department of Human Services completely dropped the debt against this person. Um, and what that meant was they then argued that um, since there was no debt, uh, it didn't need to go to court. Um, so there was no judgment following the, 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 the dropping of the debt. Um, in July 2019, the Australian Senator upper house voted for a second inquiry. That um, is due to report um, actually sometime this month. Um, not much of this month left, but still. Um, in September 2019, the former leader of the opposition, who was the shadow minister for um, services, um, actually endorsed, very unusually, a private class action, um, which brings possibility of bringing thousands of uh, people together in one collective um, court case against the government. Um, in November 2019, um, there are reports that the, the the government would stop using income averaging as the basis for raising a debt. And in 20, at the end of November 2019, uh, it seems a long time ago now, but it's not all that long ago, um, the federal court in Victoria concluded that um, income averaging and also this reverse onus of proof effectively were unlawful. Um, this in, uh, at the end of 2019, in what's called in Australia, the mid-year economic and fiscal outlook, which is an update of um, the government's budget that they do roughly six months after they um, put down a budget, um, had an interesting new entry called, uh, which they described as an unquantifiable contingent li liability. So this hadn't, there had been unquantifiable contingent liabilities before, but what this means is that there was an amount that was going to come out of the budget 
um, and they didn't know how much it was. Uh, they couldn't quantify it because it was um, uh, relating to the fact that the, the federal court had ruled um, this method was unlawful and the government had decided to drop it. Um, in March of this year, so shortly after the start of our uh, reaction to the pandemic, uh, the government initially admitted that it would have to refund more than $500 million to people affected. Um, they, uh, there was also leaking of um, uh, internal information which revealed that the government thought, thought considered they would lose the class action. Um, and it's later turned out that um, they're refunding $720 million um, to people, there's close to 500,000 people who had their debts unlawfully raised, um, and that the cost could be up to 1.5 billion because not only do they have to repay the people who they've taken the money off, um, they have to, they've entered into arrangements with some other people and they have to take this out of the forward estimates. So, so there's money that is sort of in the forward estimates. Um, and that they have to take out of the budget estimates. Uh, this doesn't include um, the, the administrative cost of the recalculations. Um, so the, the system was ramped up enormously because of this reverse onus of proof. And when averaging was ruled unlawful, they had to go and recalculate all of these 500,000 um, uh, debts that they had previously sort of automatically generated. So a lot of people were hired to, um, to uh, spend time working out whether people had actually been averaged or not. Uh, and there's also the possibility of um, damages being awarded against the government. Um, as I, the, 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 the class action is due to be start being heard in September, uh, but it might be postponed because of the, the, the pandemic. Uh, and um, opposition parties, uh, first the Green Party, um, uh, which is a minor party mainly in the upper house in Australia, and the, then the, the, the formal opposition, the Labor Party, have called for a royal commission, but that hasn't. Um, and the Labor Party has indicated that should they win government in a couple of years, they will, um, uh, they'll have a royal commission. Um, now, there are a lot of interesting, interesting is a word in inverted commas, um, interesting policy issues. Um, now, the government justified doing all this on the basis that they needed to maintain the integrity of the welfare system. Um, and the idea that people shouldn't receive public uh, money to which they're not entitled is something uh, most people would agree with. Um, there's, but it also doesn't come to grips with what's happening in the, to people's working patterns in a changing labor market. Um, in Australia over the last uh, 30 years or so, there's, um, there's been quite a high level of um, people working part-time and casually where their wages vary from fortnight to fortnight, something like um, a quarter of all Australian workers don't get the same pay each fortnight, and um, that doesn't include overtime. And there's a set of issues about how responsive to income changes should benefit systems be. Uh, and also, obviously, about um, how this unlawful decision was taken. Now, just briefly, I think the um, there are two, at least two elements that were unlawful. Um, under the Australian Social Security system, um, your entitlement in a fortnight is based on the income that you receive from other sources in that fortnight. So um, dividing your annual income by 26 um, uh, is almost certainly going to give you the wrong answer if you don't have the same income each fortnight. Um, and also, most many of the people, the largest single group of people who were affected were ex-students um, who were receiving an income tested payment while they um, studied at uh, usually at university. Uh, and um, the year, the time of year in which they finish university studies, and um, the tax years don't coincide. Uh, so. For the students, it's almost certainly wrong. The other legal principle that um, was affirmed was that um, the government can't just say you have a debt. It has to prove you have a debt. Um, so requiring the recipients to disprove they had a debt was also unlawful. Now, following from this, there were 
there's there's a, there's a cascade of unlawfulness. Um, so uh, they were had been seizing people's tax returns. Um, uh, if you didn't have a debt, that became unlawful. Um, all of the penalties that they imposed on people for not repaying the debt on time were also unlawful. Um, I think arguably it's also, this is not a question of law, but it's a question of policy. Since 2014, uh, the Australian government has what's called a red tape reduction policy, um, requiring people to prove that they didn't have a debt, um, I think is in contradiction to that policy. And there's also a whole range of things where uh, even if you did have a debt, you possibly overpaid your past income tax when they recovered the debt. I think the um, the, the really big issue, which we probably will need a Royal Commission to sort out, um, is that um, how does a government in a high income country, which has a lot of indications that it has a high quality of public administration, how does government, dis what's the processes by which they decide to do something that's unlawful? Um, uh, and they should have known it in advance because there were plenty of warnings starting off in, um, I mean, quite apart from the complaints of people, they had the adverse judgments in the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. They had a QC at the annual conference in 2017 of the Ministry of Lawyers of Australia saying he thought it was unlawful. And, and then they had these court cases. So it was, in my view, perfectly foreseeable. Um, it also raises questions which I, 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 I won't go into about um, digital decision making. Um, there's a book by and a set of studies by a, um, an American academic, Virginia Eubanks, uh, about um, uh, called Algorithms of Inequality, about how using algorithms uh, to make administrative judgments can often get you into a lot of problems. There's also an academic literature on administrative burdens, um, which relate to um, how the government tries to stop people getting uh, benefits of various sorts by putting these sorts of administrative burdens onto them. And I think this is a pretty striking example of that. The other thing is, I think that um, it's related to um, the way that Australia does its um, bud annual budgets, um, uh, where until this year, the main aim, one of the main aims of government policy has been to um, get to a surplus rather than have a deficit. So, so that the government is um, spending less money than it raises in revenue. And at the time, that was one of the main objectives of this scheme. And it's also about, I think, um, the idea that people who receive social security payments are, um, are different from us by an upstanding taxpayers. Um, I'll stop there, Cecily, and um, uh, stop Thank sharing. you. Yeah, thank you so much, Peter. Um, and as Peter mentioned, this is exactly the kind of materials that he himself is teaching and his colleagues in the Master of Public Administration and the Master of Public Policy at Crawford School. Mindful of the time, so I think we'll go straight to Kristen. Thank you, Kristen. Hi, everyone. I'll just quickly share my screen and get started. All right, can you see my screen? I think, all good. Uh, my name is Kristen Sobeck and I work at the Tax and Transfer Policy Institute at, at the Crawford School. Uh, for those of you who have looked at the Crawford School's website, you may have noticed that there are a lot of different policy centers and research institutes at the Crawford School. So I thought it might be worthwhile sharing the experience of, of one of those institutes, the Tax and Transfer Policy Institute where I work. Uh oh, see if I can. There we go. All right. Uh, so just a brief history or overview of the history of the Tax and Transfer Policy Institute. In 2009, there was an extensive review of the tax system conducted in Australia, and of the many recommendations that came out of that review, one of which was the importance of establishing an institute that would conduct independent policy research on the tax and transfer system. And fast forward a bit later from 2009, what we see is this actually happening. And so in 2013, the Tax and Transfer Policy Institute was established at the Crawford School and is where I work. <laughs> so what is the Tax and Transfer Policy Institute, TTPI? What, what do we actually do? Well, we aim to produce and support rigorous policy relevant analysis and research. We also intend or, or hope to 
aim to lead policy discussion and debate through effective engagement. I won't talk a bit, I won't talk too much about the engagement part of, of what TTPI does for time constraints today. Um, and the third point that we do is we, we aim to provide high quality education and build public sector capacity in, in policy analysis. And we do this both directly with the public sector and also at AMU with, with students as well. Um, so I'll focus the next few slides directly on our analysis and research and our educational efforts. Uh, and then I'm happy to answer any questions you might have about engagement in the time which remains. So what does TTPI do in terms of education? Well, as I mentioned, we have a lot of we offer education. We aim to educate about policy evaluation of the tax and transfer policy system, both at ANU and outside of ANU through various channels. Two of those channels are, are listed here. The first would be the empirical public finance course offered by my colleagues, uh, Professor Bob Brunig and Professor Matthias Sinning at the Crawford School. And I'll talk a teeny bit more about this class in a few slides. So that's one opportunity for students at Crawford to learn more about how to evaluate uh, tax and transfer policies. And another educational output that we produce is this tax fact series. So the tax fact series is a series of, of educational briefs of, of two pagers on different economic concepts or um, facets of the uh, specific to the Australian tax system that we attempt to explain in two pages. So you can see an example presented on the screen which talks a bit about what is deadweight loss? What is this economic concept uh, that economists refer to and take for granted that everyone understands when in fact no one does? We have some other ones which, uh, what is negative gearing? Negative gearing is a specific concept specific to the Australian tax system. Um, so, so we have uh, about 15 of these on our website. So it might be a useful resource in case you're interested in learning a bit more about the tax system or about some economic concepts in a very simple and accessible way for generalists, but also public policy uh, or public, public servants who work in the public sector. So those are two facets of the educational outreach that TTPI provides. Um, turning to some of the research areas, since we are a policy institute, we conduct a few different types of, of policy research. Uh, and I've described the first type of policy research that we do here. And then in the next slides, I'll, I'll talk about a slightly different type. So the first type of, of policy research that TTPI does are what we call policy reports. And these policy reports aim to kind of fuse economic theory and the academic literature into or translate it more so into, into policy advice directly for policymakers. So one of, example of this is our most recent report on the taxation of savings in Australia. And this policy report effectively has three chapters. The first chapter is looking at the economic theory of, of taxing savings. What does economic theory in the academic literature say about how savings should be taxed? Then in the next chapter, we look at how uh, savings actually are taxed in the Australian tax system. And then the final chapter kind of brings it all together and says, well, we have economic theory, we have the theory, and we have the practice. And, and once we combine those, how might we actually improve policy? How might we actually improve policy to make things more coherent um, according to economic theory and, and practice? So these reports are, are quite useful because we not only present them at the different government depart departments, but we also involve the government departments and the private sector and the community sector, individuals, tax experts who are engaged in this space as part of the process of producing them. So once we had drafted an initial draft of this particular policy report, we had an, an internal workshop where we consulted a lot of different people from different areas to get their feedback on, well, what do you think of this? What do you think of that? So in the end, the, the final product really represents um, evidence base, but we've also tried to consolidate the expertise from a range of different actors working on tax policy in Australia. The second type of research that TTPI does is specific policy evaluations with government. So I've tried to provide three examples. I'll briefly speak to three examples that TTPI is working, working on. Um, these three examples have actually been work that uh, we've been commissioned by different government departments to undertake. Um, so these first two examples presented here were actually commissioned by, by the Treasury 
and form a part of this ongoing review that the government is doing on retirement incomes. And so the first question they asked as part of this review, they asked TTPI to try and evaluate was what is the economic incidence of the superannuation guarantee? For those in Australia, you probably already know what the superannuation guarantee is, but for those who aren't, a very simple and, and brief overview is that in Australia, the superannuation guarantee refers to a part of the social security system. And so, for example, if you earned $100,000 uh, as your wage, your employer would be required to contribute $9,500, so 9.5% of your salary to a superannuation account which is effectively your retirement income account, private and specific to you. So over time, right now, the superannuation guarantee is set at 9.5% of your salary, um, but this has changed over time. And ongoing policy debates currently are looking at whether or not this 9.5% should actually be increased. And so one of the questions that we were commissioned to evaluate was, well, what has actually happened over time? When the superannuation guarantee amount has changed using, using lots of data, uh, who do we see actually pays for this? Is this increase in, because by increasing the superannuation guarantee, it's effectively an increase in labor costs. So are employers just biting the bullet and paying it? Or alternatively, are workers' wages going down to compensate for this increased cost? Or a third option is that consumers are paying for it through higher prices. So using lots of data, we try and evaluate this over time to attribute what we call who, who's actually paying for, for changes in these labor costs over time. Another question we were asked to look at was the effect of tax concessions on, on voluntary retirement savings. So again, if we think about if you make savings, savings, if you put an amount of savings in your, in your bank account, the government's gonna take, gonna tax a bit of what you might earn on your savings. And so if you change that tax rate, if you make it more expensive or less expensive to save, how do people react? Do they actually save more when the tax rate is lower or do they save less uh, and kind of offset those savings? So that's another question we were, we were asked to look at um, and, and the idea is that both of these research projects will feed into a, a broader government, government review of the retirement income system. And finally, just a third example I thought I'd provide was uh, from a different government department that we're, we're currently working with the Department of Social Services to try and evaluate how changes in the generosity of uh, payments to single parents, how changes in this generosity over time have impl impacted their employment outcomes. So if you reduce the amount of payment you give to single parents, uh, do they switch to another type of benefit? Do they work more? Do they work less? How, how, do, they, how do they react? What kind of jobs do they actually get in the end? Um, so this is, a, an, a, again, a, a third type of, of research that TTPI is, is working directly with government departments to undertake um, to better understand, to, 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 we work together with them uh, to, to answer some of the questions they want to know more about, um, and the objective is that these studies can help to better inform the policy design and implementation processes. So to conclude, how does TTPI interact directly with students at Crawford? Well, in several different ways. Uh, the first is fairly passive in a sense that on our website we have a lot of different educational materials. The tax facts that I mentioned earlier, we have a series of working papers, the report I showed. If you're interested in learning more about these or if you're in a class where you need to understand economic concepts, uh, our website is most certainly a resource where you can get some of this information. Uh, there are also econometric courses at the Crawford School and also through the economics department at ANU where the previous research projects and policy evaluations that I describe we use lots of large data sets and we apply econometrics in order to evaluate the, the impact of these policies. So by pursuing and taking some of these econometric courses, you can learn the general, the general statistical skills required to actually start to evaluate some of these policies for your master's thesis or um, for policies that interest you in your own countries. And uh, the empirical public finance course also offered at the Crawford School is another way to do this. So again, this course is offered by my colleagues, Professor Bob Brunig and, Matthias, and Professor Matthias Sinning. And this is using econometric knowledge and applying it specifically in the tax, in the tax space. 
so how do you actually use econometric tools to evaluate tax policies? Um, and finally, if you're interested in tax policy, we're always happy to hear from students. Some of the research assistants that work with us are, have arisen just by nature of sending an email and saying, hey, I'm interested in this and, and want to work with you. And we're always very, very happy to receive those emails from students. Um, with that, I'll turn it back over to Cecily. Thank you so much, Kristen. Um, even I didn't know a lot of that about economics at Crawford School, so thank you. <laughs> and thank you to all of our speakers uh, for an incredible array of presentations. Um, we're mindful of the time, we've got a couple of quick questions that we might deal with. And just a reminder, I have put in the chat link that both Liz and I are going to be online till five o'clock this afternoon. So please feel free to call by and have a one-on-one -on -one chat with us at that session. Um, first question, public policy studies are available as a master's degree for the Master of Public Policy um, and all of our master's degrees. We also offer short courses, so six months in a graduate certificate course, a graduate certificate of public policy and with Sango, the graduate certificate of environmental management fully online. Crawford School also offers a range of executive education opportunities. So if you go to our website, are you, and actually I'll pop that in the link now, you can look at uh, our executive educations, which are short courses and which are often a really nice sort of trial or a bridge to a much uh, longer kind of a program. Sango, there's a question there I'll throw to you from Josh, please. Sorry, I'll just unmute myself. Oh, yeah. So Josh is um, asking a couple of things. He's asking how much of the MEMD, Master of Environmental Management and Development is management and how much is development? Good question. <laughs> and also, what are the advantages of studying at ANU over other universities that also have a strong reputation in environmental science slash management, e.g. UQ? Well, some of my best friends are at UQ. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, yeah, so I would say that um, we have a fair balance like, between environmental management and development. I mean, broadly, our program is really about understanding development dilemmas, I would say, and how environment fits in with these, um, what sorts of, how can we understand the risks and opportunities and what sorts of kind of policy responses can we um, propose around those. So we are located in a public policy school. So I guess broadly our focus is around governing environment and society more effectively, if you like. Um, I guess the other connection with development is a number of us work in the region. And so the dilemmas in developing countries in our region are, are very much of interest to us. How to, how to deal with some of these very real challenges around poverty alleviation, providing basic infrastructure and services in ways that, um, that don't kind of impact negatively um, or to manage the impacts, I guess, on people and the environment. So the hydropower case is just one example of that in a sense. So I would say fairly balanced, but we're quite interested in sort of policy, understanding risks and finding ways to govern for those. Um, in terms of ANU versus other universities, I think um, our group um, is, and our program in general, I guess has its foundation in the social sciences. So our program is populated by economists, um, human geographers, and even anthropologists. So we are very interested in, because you know, when I was an undergraduate many years ago now, one of my lecturers said to me that environmental problems are actually problems about managing people and how we work in the world. And so I guess our standpoint in this environmental management and development masters is to really get to grips with, with um, how we operate in our environment, what sorts of governance systems we have, how we work on environmental issues within society. So we have a social science lens on environmental challenges. Um, and the other thing I think that is very important in our group is we have a lot of expertise on the Asia Pacific region, colleagues working in the Pacific, a number of us work in Southeast Asia, 
colleagues working in South Asia and also in Australia. So it's a really broad range of expertise which allows us to bring a lot of really rich case material into our teaching. And I would say that's another unique thing that ANU really prioritises is this research-led teaching. Um, not only in terms of what the content that we bring to our teaching, but also opportunities to, to do really meaningful research. Sometimes students um, kind of tap into existing research projects that academics are working on and perhaps do a small um, self-contained project that is part of that larger enterprise. And I think people find that really rewarding. For instance, I once had a, a student work with me on a uh, project I was doing on pollution in Vietnam and she looked at kind of a small component of that broad issue and it worked out really well. It provides kind of field work resources and things like that um, and networks that you just couldn't as a student get to on your own. So sorry to go on for a bit long but there's okay. a bit of a response. Thank you. Thank you Sango. Um, okay it is two o'clock we may have people leaving we can keep going so if it's okay with the academics just for about another five minutes if you can stay that would be wonderful but we'll excuse anyone who has to go. Question to Peter um, in that chat box have you considered doing a similar policy fiasco study on the failure of climate policy under the coalition government since 2013? It would be useful to have an account of this one in place. Um, I'm a specialist in social security policy, so I'm, I'm not going to do it. Um, there's, um, I mean, we also um, have uh, executive education courses related to um, uh, policy failure, I think. Um, but, uh, but also, you know, um, I think in the Master of Public Administration and to some extent in the Master of Public Policy, we do, you know, we, we look at a wide range of policies. And um, I mean, for example, uh, so, the short answer is I'm not the person to do it, right? Um, there are plenty of colleagues here who could, um, uh, but they, they um, you know, the work on climate uh, economics is particularly strong at the ANU, as people will know. Um, but I think that, um, you know, there are a lot of colleagues here who are particularly interested in, um, yeah, how you promote good government uh, and good governments. Um, and, um, you know, in, I think we're probably all facing an unprecedented period um, in public policy around the world. Um, and I think, um, you know, sort of we're committed to helping people find the answers to, to those public policy challenges. Okay, thank you. Um, so one of the specialisations offered in the MPP is around integrity and anti-corruption. Um, how deeply will we study integrity and anti-corruption uh, policy in that particular unit? Peter, is that one you could just touch briefly upon? Um, I don't think I can really say, because um, again, I'm not, you know, um, I'm not associated with that bit of the course. Um, uh, I may be wrong, but I think the person who deals with, uh, who provides a course in public sector ethics, for example, um, is Professor Richard Mulgan, who is, um, has a very distinguished career um, at looking at this. So um, um, I think perhaps we could, um, um, you know, if we could arrange to have the information sent to you about that. This is not something I'm afraid I can answer myself. No, that's great. All right. So, Krisner, if you wanted to email us at crawford.degrees, we can get you a more specific answer on that one. And I think for our very final question, uh, it's a question around PhDs in public policy. Just sort of what are some of the areas being explored at this level? Um, again, if any of you want to just jump in and share one or two, um, just because of time, um, of your PhD topics that are going on, that would be great. I can. Um, I, I'm, I'm supervising somebody at the moment who's doing a PhD on um, informal social protection in Pakistan, so it's certainly not limited to Australia. Uh, and, um, um, and also somebody who's doing it on um, the development of social protection in Germany, but that's um, 120 years ago. Um, so yeah, no, so we're certainly not restricted to Australia. Um, um, and, uh, and I'm sure, knowing all of my colleagues, um, here, um, yeah, no, there's there's a very wide range of countries that we supervise PhDs in, in terms of the content. Um, I might just talk about some of the projects in our area. 
very diverse. Um, for instance, I've got a student right now who's kind of stranded in Thailand, actually, <laughs> due to COVID, um, who's been working on these special economic zones in border regions and how kind of sometimes you get local resistance to these estates being set up where they're kind of building major factories, often Chinese investment involved. So she's looking at how kind of those um, kind of civil society and state relationships are playing out in these special economic zones. We've got people working in all sorts of areas, um, forest governance, fire, disasters, you name it. <laughs> Terrific. All right, and we do have a PhD page actually up on our internet, so on the website, so you're welcome to look there. Uh, it is getting late, so I just wanted to thank again um, our three speakers today, Sango, Peter and Kristen, really appreciate hearing from you and Liz for being here and to the College of Asia and the Pacific who really brought this great together uh, event together. And please keep in touch. Hopefully we'll see you now in the drop-in session. So thank you very much and goodbye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for listening. Bye.